All right, hi everyone. Welcome to our 33rd virtual shadowing session. Uh, tonight's session, we have a PA who will be discussing infectious diseases. All right, next slide. All right, let's do it. All right, so here's our virtual shadowing working group. We have Reagan, Cheyenne, Taylor, Rachel, Ani, Miriam, Rohit, myself, and Dr. Salazar, Dr. Marchetti, and Dr. Ray Fowler. <clears throat> All right, and here are some upcoming sessions. Uh, we have general surgery and obstacles to medicine, and we have nursing spotlight anesthesiology. All right, and just a friendly reminder, if you have any questions, uh, please put it in the chat. We will have two uh, Q&A sessions, one in the middle and one at the very end. And lastly, um, just a friendly reminder, we will have, or this will uh, roughly be around an hour and a half to two hours. So we will answer all questions uh, regarding the assessment at the very end. Okay. Elena, let me make uh, Elena, let me make a couple of comments. I want, want to welcome everybody. There's a thousand of you out there. So good to have you. Uh, these are just terrific sessions. And this one tonight is going to be no exception. You're just going to love Josh and can't wait to introduce him. It's so good to have you. Uh, during this session this evening, we will cross 40,000 people who have signed up on the website. So this is a momentous evening. And we're just so proud and so glad to have you here for our 33rd session. This was an idea we came up with a year ago, and it looks like an idea that really needs to be out there. So as long as you keep coming back, we're going to be here at virtual shadowing. So without further ado, well, and, and one last comment, we've had over 120,000 individual views of our program. So a very, very popular program. And because of that, we think we need to have another session on um, um, on on important things to talk about, about a career in medicine. And Brandon, if you're out there, do you want to comment about your session coming up this Thursday? Yeah, um, happy to have been invited along with uh, one of our UT Southwestern neurologists, Dr. Robin Novakovich. On Thursday, we're doing a bonus session. You should, should have gotten the link for that through the virtual shadowing uh, listserv. But we're going to be talking about um, work-life balance for those of you who um, may be non-traditional going in a little bit later in the game. Maybe you have kids, spouse, significant other. Um, I will tell you all the ways I did not do it so well uh, so that you can learn from my mistakes on Thursday at 7 p.m. And then Dr. Novakovich will tell you how she bossed it. So do what she does. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brandon. Um, well, this is just going to be a terrific uh, evening, so I'm going, to, I'm going to get off the horn. And Elena, why don't you take it away? All right. Well, I will give it to Joshua. You can go ahead and take it away. All righty. And I will hold on to it. <laughs> all right. Thank you all so much. Wonderful introductions. And we'll go ahead and get started with a little disclaimer. I have no conflicts of interest to report. I always like to put that. Every journey is unique. Keep that in mind. Results may vary. And so tonight I want to start with talking a little bit about myself, about what I do, sort of a pseudo day in the life. But uh, we also plan to get into a case study as well of a real life patient that I saw while I was working in the hospital. And then one that I'm actually still following to this day as their primary care provider. And then another or Actually, yeah, just one case, and then we will go into more of the teaching. So we like to do these, especially in ID case presentations and other specialties as well, too. Give a case, do some teaching, and then we'll allow some points, as they mentioned, for Q&A and some other little advice and tips and tricks and things. Okay, a little bit about myself. I am currently in Dallas, Texas, as most of the uh, other people who are joining us on this uh, and the group from virtual shadowing, but I am, I come by way of Washington DC. That is my hometown. I would say our home city. Uh, and I, I miss it very much so, but I do not miss the snow. Uh, I've been working in ID specifically more so HIV care. And so we'll talk a little bit more about where HIV fits into the ID spectrum, but I've been doing that since 2017 when I graduated from PA school. I have been certified in HIV care uh, since 2019 through the American Academy of HIV Medicine. Uh, some hobbies of mine, photography, piano. If some of you that follow me on Instagram, I, I post photography and random music things on there. 
I also co-host a podcast uh, called Family Time. It has nothing really to do with medicine. It just happens to feature other people who work in medicine. Uh, but I feature Peter, who was on here once before, and non other PAs. And it's become more of an Asian American focus. But certainly, we're going to broaden into season two. But anyways, yeah, that's briefly me playing some piano. Okay, so a little bit about my journey a little more now. Before PA school, I attended George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. So not too far right outside of DC, maybe 20, 30 minutes. And got my uh, bachelor's in biology with a concentration in microbiology specifically. I worked as a patient transporter at the local Inova uh, Fairfax Hospital then when I graduated, I actually had some years where I was off of school, sort of gap years, um, just to kind of figure out what I wanted to do. I, 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 also, I was going down a PDF, I'm not sorry, PDF, ugh, PhD route, sorry, uh, and uh, looking into cancer research, but uh, it was doing cancer research Georgetown where I met PAs and sort of learned about the PA profession and worked with PAs and realized that's something that I wanted to do. And hopefully, you know, return to doing research in some capacity, which I can touch upon later as well. And some other things that I did when I was in undergrad, pre-health clubs, uh, of course, and I, just to, you know, network with other pre-health students and get in other pre-health groups. And then cultural clubs, uh, I am half Filipino and half Burmese. And so there was a Filipino cultural club. So it was a nice thing for me to do to connect to other people who were the same ethnicity and other Asians. And so I'm very proud of my heritage because of my experiences with them and what I've learned. So certainly I highlight those mainly because there's no like recipe for do this, do this and do this to get into PA school or do this and this and this to get uh, into med school, certainly having a wide breadth of experiences are very important. And that's what I want to highlight. I didn't really spend most of my time doing much pre-health stuff when I was an undergrad. I mostly did a lot of different extracurriculars and sort of sports and uh, really enjoyed the time there and volunteer when I could as well too. And that was variety of stuff. I didn't really do much health volunteering. It was more so community volunteering. And so I think when it comes to your applications and whatnot, certainly being a little, have, having a, a wide breadth or, or something that's maybe non-health shows your diversity or your wide range of experience. Um, and that's the statue out of George Mason right in front of the campus. Okay, let's see here. So yeah, uh, and then I applied to PA schools probably a, a few years after I graduated from undergrad, got into Drexel and uni uh, Drexel University in Philadelphia, Center City, uh, which is about a 27 month program where you had 12 months of didactic base of just the clinical teaching and sciences and pharmacology and so on and so forth. And then 15 months of of rotation specific clinicals, uh, wide range. I'm sure you all have heard about all the ones from OBGYN to um, ER to pediatrics to family medicine, internal medicine, uh, general surgery. Those were sort of the core ones that we have to do and along with psychiatry. And then I had a couple electives that I got to do that were primary care focused or uh, internal medicine focused, uh, which I'll touch upon. And then I worked part-time as a peer tutor uh, to sort of tutor first year or our, our undergrad students. Certainly that it definitely is hard to carry a job while uh, studying and being in PA school or any medical program. So certainly the, uh, the peer tutor was part of my university. So it was something I was able to fit in. They understood that I was a current student. So certainly if you're looking to make extra cash while you're in school, that's certainly an option. If you feel confident enough, I attended a national conference as well. And I highlight that mostly because certainly if you have the opportunity, definitely do it. Uh, you get to network, meet other people, other future PAs and current PAs or other current medical providers. And certainly, again, networking is a big part, uh, especially, you know, once we're able to all get back into meeting each other in conferences and things like that. Uh, definitely, you know, you have to get yourself out there and to be known. Uh, and so, like I said, I had uh, two 
uh, almost three month rotations that were what we call our preceptorships. And they're supposed to be primary care, internal medicine or family medicine focused. I had one specifically at, uh, that was mostly infectious disease at the VA in Philadelphia, the Veterans Affairs Hospital. And then another one doing HIV specific primary care at a federally qualified health center, also in center city, Philadelphia. And I highlight those ones because those were the two rotations for me that, that made me say, yeah, I definitely want to do ID. I definitely want to work in HIV care. I honestly was not that interested in it before going into PA school. I didn't really know what I wanted to do specifically. I know I wanted to, I think part of me wanted to actually go into uh, internal medicine, say like cardiology. And then part of me was doing, oh, maybe I could do emergency medicine or urgent care. And uh, I guess, as they say, that this is sort of how things fell and things worked out. And thankfully, I was able to uh, find land a job doing ID HIV down here in Dallas, uh, which I'll touch upon. There's me in the center with a bunch of my classmates. A lot of them work around the country. Not, not many of them stayed in Philadelphia, but certainly I still keep in touch with many of them. And I also highlight it just because certainly PA school, med school is hard and it's the time when you will meet your lifelong friends or lifelong friend. And uh, yeah, you, you can, it's hard to get through these programs by yourself. And I, I attribute a lot of, of my success and being able to stay focused to a lot of uh, their uh, encouragement. And, you know, we had a lot of study groups together too. Certainly we all didn't study together at once because that's way too many people, <laughs> but uh, you know, certainly, you know, having friends to lean on, especially during hard times of graduate programs is very important. Okay, so yeah, I landed a job in infectious diseases, specifically HIV, but also some non HIV care as well. So a little bit about infectious diseases, it is considered a subspecialty of the internal medicine field. Uh, it includes many things like I had mentioned HIV care, primary care. Certainly, we involve it, we're involved in any infections that cover any and every organ system. Travel infection, tropical infections, travel medicine, another big part of ID. Transplant medicine is also a part of ID care. And then sexual health, uh, sexually transmitted infections. That sort of sometimes also gets looped into primary care field, but certainly we're very much involved with that as well. And you will find infectious disease specialists, MDs, DOs, PAs, NPs working in your hospital setting inpatient side, and then also in clinics on the outpatient side. And I have the privilege of being able to do both, which I will talk about momentarily. Okay. Yeah, I like to bring up these old public health posters. I believe this was probably... This was printed probably about the time of the Spanish or the, sorry, the 1919 influenza, 1917 influenza. And so, um, yeah, that was their way to hopefully stop people from spitting. Didn't work out too well, fortunately. Uh, okay, so what do I do? Half of my time is inpatient. Uh, I am a member of the consult team. So the infectious disease consult team, uh, our hospital is unique in the sense that the HIV or sorry, the infectious disease team or infectious disease umbrella is split into three separate groups. You have the general ID, which is consists of pretty much every infection that's not bone and joint related and not HIV related infection. So anything from just TB, different forms of tuberculosis, aspergillosis, fungal infections, other bacterial infections, even your run of mill like sepsis, pneumonias in patients who don't have HIV versus the bone and joint service specifically focuses on orthopedic infections, mostly uh, a lot of uh, patients that have to get amputations for certain infections or gangrenous foot wounds or diabetic foot ulcers and trying to manage those. And then the HIV service where I spend most of my time, we, everyone on that service has HIV and has some sort of infection that's being managed, whether that is related to HIV or it is something like pneumonia or tuberculosis or, uh, or it is a bone and joint infection, some orthopedic infection, some foot wound or something like that. And so it, it encompass, the HIV service encompasses elements of general ID and bone and joint. And so I'm very privileged that I get to spend most of the time with the HIV service. And by consult team, 
and I will touch upon this in the case. We uh, there's you know in, in the inpatient side you have a primary team of hospitalist or teaching team uh, that may consist of different residents and um, and an attending and they will they're sort of the overseers of everything that's happening with the patient that is admitted and then they will reach out and consult us for example to help manage said infections or help manage HIV in the setting. And so we will provide our recommendations or they'll allow us to step in and put in certain orders as well too, and imaging and, and all to help co-manage a patient while they're in the hospital. And then uh, other half of my time is spent outpatient and uh, doing HIV specific primary care. And so if I'm on the HIV service, we see a lot of patients there who may be newly diagnosed with HIV or have been out of care. And so then they need to get plugged into a clinic. And sometimes that's the clinic that I'll work at on the outpatient side. And we have the privilege of following up with them in that primary care clinic or in the HIV clinic. The HIV clinic also functions as a sort of an all around clinic where we have sort of a, a pseudo urgent care. Uh, certainly anything more serious we'll send over to the ER and then hospital follow up. So like I said, anyone that had something related in the hospital uh, they would follow up with us in the clinic setting, uh, say mm -hmm. they're on long-term antibiotics and uh, by IV with a PICC line. And we would have to sort of manage them on a weekly basis and monitor them to make sure that they're getting the adequate levels of whatever that antibiotic might be for say four weeks or six weeks. Uh, and again, we follow them on an as needed basis until they complete their uh, medication therapy or the antibiotic therapy. Hey, Josh, we're getting some yeah. questions about what's, what's the difference between inpatient and outpatient? Uh, some of these folks are, are, you know, really new to medicine. Would you mind mentioning that? Yeah, of course. So I, the, I guess the, 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 the basics of an inpatient, more so just hospital, uh, hospital, staying in the hospital, treating a patient who's admitted into the hospital um, and on the floor in the hospital or ICU, MICU, what have you, uh, you know, they're there day and night until they get discharged versus outpatient is your normal clinic setting. Someone's coming there to see their PCP. Someone's coming, uh, say, to an outside urgent care. That's considered an outpatient clinic. Someone that is sort of, you know, they're visiting, I guess, versus staying. I guess more. That's, uh, I don't know if that, does that make sense? I guess you could also probably yeah. add that an inpatient is someone whose illness is such is that they actually have to come into the hospital to have their disease attended to, whereas an outpatient is someone that doesn't have to come into the hospital, that their disease can be managed by various services uh, that are uh, offered by the hospital, but they don't have to be in the hospital. Yeah, that's that great. Reason? Thank you. Yeah. I think. Thank you. Awesome. Eh, another poster. I don't know how old this one is. This one came from... New York, <laughs> but it's always fitting now that we're still going through this. Okay, so I wanted to go a little bit more specifics of what I do on the inpatient side. So our infectious disease HIV team, uh, which I'll be going back on tomorrow, usually consists of a fellow. And so that is a, an internal medicine resident graduate, uh, PGY4, who is um, further specializing in infectious diseases. He'll usually be, he or she will usually be running the team. And then we'll have our uh, ID faculty attending on the team, overseeing, and then it's usually me or another PA, or sometimes we do have an NP. And that's pretty much it, it's us team of three. And our day mostly consists of seeing any patients we're following up on while they're getting antibiotics in the hospital or getting their HIV managed in the hospital. We'll meet as a team later in the morning to update, provide updates to the attending, updates to the fellow. And then we'll at some point see new consults. We'll usually, since there's two or three of us on the team, we'll split the new consults of, of patients, patients that we get asked to come see. We'll split them up and then break for lunch when we can. And then usually in the early afternoon, we'll discuss the consults as a team the new patients. And then unique to us is that uh, we have social workers that get involved in a lot of the HIV care. And so we have what are known as case management rounds and we meet with our 
our social workers, our case workers to sit and go, hey, this patient is having you know difficulties with um, housing or difficulties with transportation, and that's why they have not been taking their medications, or that's why they've been out of care for so long. And so they help us in getting them one plugged back into a clinic on the outpatient side to follow up, and then to make sure that they have a good long-term care plan to make sure that they can make their appointments or attend their appointments. And then at some point later in the afternoon, we will round on those new patients as a team because say the fellow went to go see a new patient and I went to go see a new patient separately. Uh, the attending wants to, of course, oversee and they have to you know, uh, lay their hands or lay their eyes on the patient as well. And we'll go together as a team. And then depending on how the time goes, we'll finish notes. And so, yeah, that's pretty, pretty typical day follow-ups and then new patients. And then kind of as things come and sometimes new consults come throughout the day and then we may see them as a team, but uh, certainly it is a, a team effort. Okay. And then the outpatient side, I mostly function as a primary care provider for people living with HIV or the terminology you'll see a lot in documentation is PLWH was people living with HIV or PWH was people with HIV. And certainly we're moving away from the terminology of saying someone is HIV positive or HIV negative, or someone is an HIV patient, you know, in, in the same way that we say someone, this person has diabetes or this person has hypertension. Uh, we're moving away from, you know, before of saying, you know, hypertensive patient or a diabetic patient, certainly, you know, people are not their diagnoses, but uh, you know, we want to use people focused or person first terminology. Uh, and that's my little spiel on that outpatient side. I work alongside other PAs, other NPs or nurse practitioners, other MDs and DOs as well, uh, who are part of our faculty or our fellows as well in training or sometimes we do have residents as well there too. And they may be seeing patients again, serving as a primary care provider for our patients, working partly of any acute needs or urgent care needs that we could manage and any follow-ups from patients that were recently admitted in the hospital and just regular routine follow-ups that you would in any primary care setting. Again, uh, we function more like a patient-centered medical home. And so in HIV care, and you'll see this in a lot of HIV clinics throughout the country, uh, they try to make it a one-stop shop in the sense that uh, some will actually have a pharmacy attached to them, ours used to, but we have our financial services there. We have insurance where they'll help with insurance coverage, uh, our insurance plans. We have medical case managers and social workers who, again, will help patients, whether that's housing needs, funding needs, um, transportation needs, or even uh, food needs. And uh, certainly we do what we can from that side to help them because um, we, we want to take more of a holistic approach when it comes to treating a lot of our patients with HIV. Uh, certainly it's a, a lifelong battle. Uh, for the most part, and we um, want to support them every which way we can. And that also includes uh, a newer addition we have in our clinic is uh, psychiatry. And so we do have one psychiatrist there who's there twice a week helping to manage uh, mental health needs, uh, because that is also a big component of HIV care, as well as two therapists who are there on staff almost every day, again, helping us for patients who are battling with anxiety and depression may or may not be related to their diagnoses or related to HIV, but certainly is related to now more recently, uh, the events of this past year. Uh, and then, you know, we owe a lot to them for helping us support our patients. So on my uh, typical day in clinic, uh, we usually do have conferences or grand rounds where it's usually led by fellows. So our physicians in training, our ID fellows, ID physicians in training, and they will present a case or we'll have a guest speaker. They'll present a case in the morning and then we'll, as a group, discuss it. Uh, and then, uh, then we start our clinic day and it's, it's variable. Again, like I said, we'll have, you know, I'll have anywhere from 10 to 14 patients. There'll be new patients who are new to the clinic or newly diagnosed with HIV. There'll be patients who are just there for routine follow-up and doing well some who may be not as well. And then um, 
again, I didn't mention this, but as a primary care provider, we also manage on top of the HIV things like hypertension, diabetes, uh, hyperlipidemia, as well as doing any vaccines, health screenings, uh, say, you know, colon cancer screening or mammography, breast cancer screening, cervical, we'll do uh, cervical cancer screening with pap smears. Uh, it's, we again, try to take care of what we can in the clinic, certainly not all in one visit, but, uh, you know, for our established patients over time, we will help manage these things and then do referrals as needed, say, whether that's to physical therapy or to, um, GI or to, um, surgery or occupational health or, um, or sorry, occupational therapy. And then as with everything else in medicine, we have administrative tasks we have to take care of from training to finishing notes and meetings and so on and so forth. And that's certainly variable, but more or less that, that is my day. Uh, and I didn't go to choose specifics, but usually when I'm uh, outpatient, it's uh, 10 hour shifts. Uh, and then when I'm inpatient, it's usually eight hour shifts. And, uh, and so it's uh, more or less a 40 hour a week, depending on where I'm at. And again, variable on patient load and how things go and show rates, of course, too. Um, and then I didn't list it in here as well, too. Uh, you know, we, given how things are, you know, given the pandemic, we've switched to a lot of patients to virtual visits or telemedicine. And so that number of 10 to 14 will have an intermingling of follow-ups that we do by phone, or if there's certain things that we can, urgent needs we can address by phone or screening we can do by phone, we'll do that. Um, and by phone, it can be audio, or we have been using a, a secure app to sort of video and FaceTime securely and privately with patients. Uh, I think we call it doximity, but yeah, it's it's been quite variable, which is nice. and. Uh, uh, it's, 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 is the future of medicine, right? You know, as we know it, um, uh, from the outpatient setting, uh, no matter what specialty or, um, or even if you go into primary care, that is in your future moving forward, whether you go PA, MD, NP, DO, or in some health fields, you're going to interface with your patients digitally, I think moving forward now. And, um, uh, that's, you know, we must embrace it. <laughs> Okay, I hope I'm not going too fast, but uh, let's see here. And yeah, that's the outside of the building that I work at. So uh, Josh, this is, this is Fowler again. Yeah. Do you think that with the COVID thing and us having to go virtual on so many things, including uh, <clears throat> this vast increase in telemedicine, do you think that we'll roll back from telemedicine and back to the office visits or what do you think is going to happen? I, I think uh, to answer that, to, per, to a percentage, I don't think we'll 100% roll back. I think a lot of patients will continue on that. Maybe they'll be less frequently in office, but I know as far as billing and coverage, I know that they have allowed uh, or they have increased coverage for, I know a lot of APPs or advanced practice providers to get reimbursed. I want to say it's, I got to double check on Medicare. Um, for their telehealth visits. And so I think uh, insurance companies are responding or, or to the increasing need for telehealth. Uh, so I don't think it will completely go away. I'm sure we will you know, find a happy medium, but I, I think uh, given you know, the state of things and how things I'm you know, projecting will go, I think we'll just have to be flexible. There'll be patients that sometimes can't make it. And so being able to go telehealth uh, will be helpful or the ones that need to come in, they'll come in. And so, uh, you know, I, we're not going to completely roll back. I don't, I, I don't think, but uh, I think we'll just, it'll be a flexible as needed basis for patients. Josh, do you think that the future though, is that we will be more connected with our patients rather than less? I hope we're more connected with our patients. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, certainly a building or, you know, these masks and other barriers have distanced us from our patients uh, on the outpatient side. So I'm, I'm hoping we can at least digitally stay connected. And, you know, we, through um, Epic, we have, you know, or there's the my chart things that some people are familiar with or connecting with patients that way electronically um, where they can send messages and see their results. I, I think uh, 
in some ways that helps them, you know, stay connected and stay on top of their health or be aware of the, of what's going on. And, uh, and so, yeah, I, I think, you know, or I hope that we'll be more connected digitally, you know, um, as, you know, as we move forward. Well, things are changing, you know, for example, this week in the journal of the American medical association was an article about the use of your smart watch, uh, for not just a single lead ECG, but, a, and actually a 12 lead ECG, which to me suggests, you know, an increasing ability for electronics to be able to connect, so, connect us more and more to the physiology of our patients. I don't mean to get, to get off the subject, but I, I just was, I wanted to pick your brain a little bit. Yeah. I, and I, I, and to add on to that, I've certainly seen like those special stethoscopes that, that, you know, can reproduce sounds and stuff. And if patients are able, or if I'm sure someday those watches will be able to, you know, pick up, you know, heart sounds or maybe run those EKGs. And I, I you know, there's always a pros and cons to everything. Uh, certainly I think it has to come with the, uh, you know, teaching patients risk versus benefits for knowing that much information at your fingertips and, and you know, how, you know, and with the caveat of always, you know, res, you know, um, you know, referring back to your primary care provider, preferring, you know, you know, referring to, you know, to your primary clinician when it's, you know, if there's any, you know, concerns, I don't, you know, to, you know, I, I use technology is more like a tool and not necessarily a crutch, I guess is how I want to put it. Well, thank you, Josh, please keep yeah. going. Of course. Um, yeah, so I will go ahead and go into the case study here. Um, so let's get this rolling. All right, so this is a case of a patient that uh, I saw with the team in the hospital, I wanna say early on in the pandemic. Okay, more or less. All right, so it was a 29 year old Hispanic cisgender male with no known medical history presented to the ER with fever, weight loss, productive cough for about a month. Prior to admission, he received a course of antibiotics from a local urgent care. Symptoms didn't improve. Over the past week, he noted progressively worsening shortness of breath, and now he can't walk 20 feet without, having to, without stopping to catch his breath. Uh, as far as uh, history we were able to gather or the, we got from the ER notes as well too, prior to us being consulted, a patient lives in Texas uh, for a couple years, originally from Mexico, no other recent travel, no pets to report, no history of jail time or incarceration, lives with a roommate, denied any illicit drug use like marijuana or any other substances, and then denied injection drug use. Did, however, report multiple sex partners in the past, uh, with the variety being male and uh, female. Uh, these were his vitals upon presentation that we gathered, um, or at least we gathered from, that we saw from the ER notes. O2 sat on room air, was at rest at about 95%, but then with an ambulatory O2 sat, it, it quickly declined, and respiratory rate also was up, and heart rate certainly tachycardic, and was also having a fever roughly about 39 degrees uh, centigrade uh, Celsius. And then while he was in the ER labs, blood cultures were drawn and then imaging was also performed. So of course, uh, as Dr. Fowler knows, you always get the, the chest X-ray first. And so for the most part, I'm, I wasn't gonna dive too much on, on reading chest X-rays, but um, I, I was just gonna big point on this is that the chest X-ray was quite unremarkable, kind of normal. <laughs> Uh, that's my normal sign on it. Uh, and, and so, you know, certainly there was no explanation. There was no clear, you know, as we'd say, consolidation or any sign of a bacterial pneumonia that was going on or any clear sign of maybe even viral pneumonia or some other, you know, lung Ill infection that we could clearly see on in the chest x-ray. And that usually calls for further imaging. And at this point, the patient's um, oxygen quickly declined and he soon was admitted to the medical intensive care unit and then subsequently intubated um, at that point. Uh, they started him on empiric IV antibiotics with vancomycin and uh, IV SOS in the trade name for piperacillin tazobactam. Uh, and then 
we had some, so the lab results they drawn. And so what's unique about the uh, ER that uh, I'm associated with that they will get an HIV test on everyone that presents uh, regardless of what they present for. And so in this patient that had shortness of breath and cough and weight loss, yes, he was young. Certainly, you know, at the time COVID is on everyone's uh, mind, uh, that actually came up negative. And then the soon results that came up were that uh, he had two positive HIV tests uh, and with conf confirmation that it was HIV serotype one and then CD4 T cells came up 120. And so for reference here, um, I guess to explain those a little further, there are two major serotypes of HIV or two subtypes. There's the type one and type two. Type two is mostly in uh, West and Sub-Saharan Africa. And you uh, usually will not find it in many other parts of the world unless someone has traveled from there. So it's the, the minority of the subtypes. And then HIV-1 is the majority of what people have uh, when you encounter them. And that's found worldwide. And that's the one that most of our the medications treat for. And then for reference, so CD4 T cells, uh, HIV is you know short for the human immunodeficiency virus. It attacks T cells or specifically CD4 cells. Um, and uh, and over time, will attack those cells and they will decline. And so a normal range is about anywhere, probably they'd say about 500 to 700 in a normal healthy individual, or, or sorry, not normal, a healthy individual without HIV. And then someone with HIV, if that level declines less than 200, in this case, this indi individual had T cells of 120. Uh, that was very low, and we, that's sort of where we would diagnose this as AIDS. And this, um, you know, at this point, uh, the you know he was admitted to the MICU. The primary team had quickly consulted HIV uh, infectious disease team that I was a part of to come meet the patient, you know, and evaluate, and then help them with antibiotic management. Uh, so yes, we were cons consulted. Certainly that x-ray I showed you before was uh, unremarkable and not very helpful. And so we recommended that a dedicated CZ chest be done to help us evaluate what was going on. Ideally in the situation with someone that has a cough or uh, someone that is short of breath like he was, if we could get a sample of a sputum to culture, that would be ideal. Uh, but if we didn't get any answers that way from any other testing that we recommend, whether that's blood or from the imaging, we'd have to consider doing a bronchoscopy. So having pulmonology consulted to, you know, stick a camera and get a sampling down that way. Uh, at this point, so blood cultures were drawn. It had been about 24 hours and they were negative. And so uh, a note on blood cultures, uh, most of the time, specifically, they will be looking at bacterial growth. Uh, or they can pick up other things, but uh, certainly if someone is septic and, and they say from a common pneumonia, that blood culture will show up positive at some point for a bacterial infection. And so early on, we weren't getting much information on what was causing his you know, shortness of breath, what was causing his cough. And certainly he declined really quickly and uh, without explanation. And, you know, keep in mind, young 29 year old man. And now that we know that he has HIV and very low immune system with a low T cell count. Uh, and he was still spiking fevers and still intubated at this point. Uh, again, no clear cause. We still ha had him on broad spectrum antibiotics, as they would say, with the vancomycin and the, uh, the um, Zosin or the Piperacil and Tazobactam. Uh, and so I'll just keep going here. So at this point, you know, we are as a team discussing the patient, trying to figure out, okay, well, you know, he's been on at this point, it's been probably almost two days. He's been on IV antibiotics. Clearly there is no, you know, they would cover a broad spectrum of bacterial causes. Uh, and uh, from anyone who's had micro classes, you know, gram negative and gram positive coverage, certainly those are and any um, num possible pneumonia coverage for this patient. But, you know, 
certainly in any patient, regardless of them having HRV or not, bacterial pneumonia, specifically strep pneumonia, is the most common etiology. And the antibiotics we had him on were covering that, uh, and he wasn't improving. Other things we consider, especially since uh, he, we now know he has HIV, certainly mycobacterium tuberculosis, but you know the, the quick decline didn't seem very, um, didn't really fit with the picture of it. And, and then the other thing, of course, this was the other big thing, pneumocystis pneumonia, or what's also known as PCP is something that, of course, we discussed um, as something that we could possibly treat and work up. Uh, and then the last thing is other viral pneumonias. And so when, as a team, we're coming up with sort of differentials and figuring out what's going on with this patient, why, you know, they decline so quickly, we take all these into account, we rank them, and then we look at, okay, what test can we do that would provide us the most yield? Certainly we can, you know, getting cultures, um, whether that's from sputum, that could take a while uh, and he's intubated. So it would be definitely hard to get a decent amount of sputum for culturing. Uh, intubation is something we could consider, but he's also on, you know, several precautions because if we're trying to roll out tuberculosis, certainly we don't want to expose other people to tuberculosis without proper N95 masking. Uh, and getting a, a tuberculosis sampling can take weeks for us to get an answer. And if we were to start him on antibiotics for that, um, that was also can be very toxic. So, and then, you know, pneumocystis pneumonia, at this point, we were sort of putting that higher up on our differential, mostly because of the picture. We knew he had HIV and this is, I'll go into this more, but this is a very um, common per se HIV related infection or patients that are immunocompromised, not necessarily HIV, but immunocompromised. It's a very common pneumonia. Uh, and that was something that we could get some blood sampling to figure out, or we could get some possibly needed a bronchoscopy to figure out. But again, we'd have to, at this point, we knew the antibiotics weren't working. We had to change something. And then the other thing, viral pneumonias, certainly there's a whole bunch other you know, MERS, SARS, other, you know, it wasn't, we knew the COVID was negative and, you know, about this time, I think we're out of flu season, but certainly, you know, influenza related, RSV, other pneumonias that we're able to find. And so, but we could get a respiratory panel to see other viruses that might be involved. So we got that chest CT, we got the read back, and I want to highlight um, I don't have a normal one to show you, but I can show you here that there is a lot of um, what the read came out as ground glass opacities bilaterally on this. And you can see here on the lung parenchyma, it's certainly looking a bit fuzzy throughout these areas, but uh, this was not picked up on the, the chest x-ray. And I just like to, you know, highlight that, you know, the chest x-ray is great. And you know, but in the case of this patient that was quickly declining, a, a CT was is more ideal um, to rule out what's going on, and and so we were still waiting on more blood tests and um, for this patient to figure out what exactly was causing this. But uh, in some ways, we would consider this pathognomonic or or highly suggestive of what is known as PCP or pneumocystis pneumonia. And so what we did was, you know, we said, hey, let's start on trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, which is Bactrim trade name for short. Start them on IV about every six hours, five mg per kg. And then also start him on steroids because his case was what we'd consider severe given that he was intubated and declined so quickly. Steroids has also proven benefit in helping the airways during this uh, pneumonia. And, um, the respiratory viral panel came up completely negative. There was no signs of other respiratory viruses causing his symptoms. At this point, blood cultures were completely negative. Um, again, they, look, they will look for bacteria and I'll go into this more detail, but pneumocystis pneumonia is a fungal specific pneumonia and it's not gonna get pulled up on blood cultures, especially since it's also in the lungs too. And he was improving. He, um, the, the fevers had calmed down that maybe have been the steroids, but also he had also been, you know, on the, a new antibiotic to treat his, what we presumed was a fungal pneumonia. And then at this point we said, Hey, let's go ahead and stop those other antibiotics that those high dose ones that can certainly be kidney toxic. 
And, and so again, he eventually was extubated about now is a week into the admission. So he was pulled out, he was brought back on the floor uh, to be managed by a hospitalist primary team. They we tapered his steroids down. Um, and then we were eventually able to switch him to an oral formulation for his Bactrim or the trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. So he's able to tolerate things by mouth now. He's getting a lot better. Uh, and we finally got his viral load back. And uh, I, I throw this in there because this is part of the testing that we do as well. Uh, and it's a very important part of HIV care is knowing how many copies of a virus uh, of the HIV virus is in the blood uh, and that can help us direct treatment as well. And so clearly um, he had a high, what we'd call burden of disease, given that there was many millions of copies and we already saw that his you know, immune system was very weak. And, and so the virus had a lot of um, time or room to really wreak havoc. Uh, at this point, like I said, he was, you know, they extubated him. He was getting a lot better, still on the um, oral Bactrim improving. We were able to, you know, give him actually this HIV diagnosis at this point and then provide a lot of counseling education. We actually got him, you know, connected to our clinic scheduled with us, uh, outpatient. We started him on HIV treatments in house. We, you know, told him the importance of how HIV treatment is important for his overall health and improving his immune system, but also preventing further infections. The uh, pneumonia that he experienced, and I'll go into this in more detail soon, uh, is something that can be prevented if someone, you know, has good control or is on has good control of the HIV virus and their immune system is. You know, strengthen because of them being on medication. So this is something that is uh, completely preventable that he experienced. Um, and then, so we started him on a single tablet, which is usually a combination of medications to treat his HIV virus. And he only is taking it once a day. And then, you know, at this point, I think he was about doing some inpatient physical therapy, he was improving. And then uh, eventually discharged after about, yeah, about say, I think it was a little over two weeks, he got discharged. And then I got to see him in clinic for a hospital follow-up. At this point, it probably was about, I want to say three and a half weeks now since he first presented the hospital. Uh, he was tolerating the meds very well, wasn't having any side effects. And um, at this point, he had completed the pneumonia treatment uh, outpatient now with just the oral Bactrim. And then uh, we, because of his weakened immune system, we would switch him to what's known as a long-term prophylaxis or secondary prophylaxis until his immune system improves. And about two months after that, I saw him, I saw him for a routine follow-up and his viral load was now undetectable. And I can talk about that in a little bit, meaning that the virus, he, the HIV medication he was taking has now got the virus under control. Uh, we can't cure HIV, but we are able to keep it under control and uh, not wreak havoc. And his immune system was also improving at this point. And so now at about six months later, and so this was pretty recently, I'd say I saw him, we stopped his Bactrim and uh, because his immune system improved and now he's only taking that single HIV medication tablet. Uh, and so, uh, is to like wrap up his case, a uh, very classic example of someone that, you know, presents at the hospital with a major illness, super weak in immune system, and, you know, we're able to control the infection and, and get them started on treatment. And then we're able to follow up with them, watch them get better in inpatient, but then outpatient, we get to see them improve. And, um, you know, now I'm his primary care provider. And, you know, I, I feel very privileged and honored that I'm, I'm able to see patients like him who, again, come in newly diagnosed or come in very sick, and then you watch them get better through time. And, uh, and you know, again, very, very fortunate to do that, thanks to medications and, you know, on his part of taking the medications. So I think I'd make that a good time to stop for a Q&A, I hope. So, so Josh, in this patient, did his viral load uh, go 
essentially to zero or over time and so on? Yeah. Uh, and so we have the lab reported it as undetectable slash not detected. And yeah, he, he got there in about two months. The meds worked really fast. <laughs> it's been astonishing in my career to see that, as you and I talked about before, I, I've been practicing over 40 years. And in the early 80s, we started seeing people just like this show up horribly short of breath, and we didn't know what was wrong with them. Finally, uh, Fauci and his crew at the NIH identified HIV, and ultimately over time, the medications came. When HIV first showed up, we thought it was gonna kill anybody that got it. It was infecting the blood supply and so forth. Now it's a disease, as I'm sure you're gonna talk about, that people can get the disease, and if they'll take care of themselves, they can live a normal life and, and have the up and experience the other things that take people's life away, like car wrecks, you know, and heart attacks and yeah. so forth. But, but HIV won't be the problem. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You see, um, in your practice, do you see people who will stop taking their meds and uh, HIV meds sometimes? Yeah, for a number of reasons. And, you know, we're not seeing, you know, patients that stop and then they all of a sudden just, you know, collapse or just get super sick quickly, but it's a progressive thing that happens with their immune system. And then unfortunately they will get some infection and they'll show up at the ER and, and get admitted. Um, and I'm sure as you've seen Dr. Fowler, um, patients who were previously doing so well, and then for a variety of reasons, just stop taking their meds and then they end up, yeah, in the hospital. I've noticed of late on the commercials on TV, which I watch, that there are even prophylactic medications for the partners of patients who are living with HIV that uh, can, uh, I guess that's pre-exposure prophylaxis, I guess. Is that right, John? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I'll touch upon that as well um, briefly, I think, at the end. But yeah, if a person who does not have HIV wants to protect themselves, say they have a partner with HIV or they um, have a lot of, um, or they have multiple partners that they're unaware of their status, but they still want to protect themselves. Um, there's a pill that people can take, kind of like a birth control pill that you take it once a day and you can effectively prevent transmission or prevent contraction of the virus. Well, we have a page of questions already. Elena, you want to take it away? Uh, yes. So one question is, is what are some of the key differences in the duties of a PA versus a doctor? Were there any other factors that persuaded you towards the PA route than the medical school route other than working alongside PAs of Georgetown? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. In my setting, as a primary care provider, we function essentially as the MDs would do or the DOs would. Uh, we consult and work with them. We see their patients. They see our patients too because we're all at work in a team function. And the same thing happens. We're in the hospital too. We work as a team. Uh, certainly the fellow will run the show and a lot of times we'll make the final call in certain things or the attending will make the final call. But when I'm following a patient, I, you know, I can, you know, change the antibiotics, order the antibiotics, order imaging that might be needed when I'm inpatient or, you know, make certain changes. I'll relay stuff back to the primary team. I'll work with the caseworkers. I, you know, I am, just as part of the team as they are. It's just on the inpatient side, they're more the, the supervising or sorry, the attending MD will, or DO will act as the sort of the boss, uh, the leader of the team, I should say boss, the leader of the team. And then on the outpatient side, I am, you know, overseeing the patient, the care of that patient and, and consulting my colleagues on an as needed basis, but it's not a constant supervision sort of thing. Uh, and that is what, you know, drew me to being a PA. I, you know, I enjoy the, the team setting very much. So, uh, and, you know, and patients appreciate it too. They, they know that it's, you know, not all falling on the shoulders of one provider and that if, if say I'm not available, um, you know, another provider is available in this, in these team settings. And so, yeah, that, that drew that to me. And, uh, you know, I, yeah, <laughs> I think that yeah, that's for the most part of, I guess, being a PA and that happens being an MD too, you're part of a team as well. But for me, uh, you know, the, the, I guess the PA line, I saw the flexibility in it, uh, at first, like, Oh, you know, cause of the PAs I worked with, they did time in emergency medicine, but then, and urgent care. And then some went on to do um, 
you know, they were more in like OBGYN is where I saw them uh, at this point. But so, you know, they can sort of wouldn't want to say jump around, but they had the flexibility with experience to um, sort of um, switch specialties. Uh, but I don't want to make that seem that's like a, a sort of a, a just a, a quick decision. That's something that PAs have the luxury of doing, um, you know, throughout their careers. Okay. Well, to follow up with that question, mm -hmm. um, have you ever encountered a situation where you disagreed with the doctor's treatment? If so, how did you handle it? Yes. Oh, these are, these are interview questions. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, yeah, certainly there have been, I mean, a couple of times, I, I think for the most part with our, with my attendings, they're very understanding. They, I've worked with them long enough that they will respect my input as I respect their input as well too, regarding the care of a patient, certainly I know where not to cross the line. Um, certainly they will come with their own breadth or, or years of experience beyond what I have. And so I respect that and they respect what I have, say, if it's with my own patient. And so, um, yeah, I, I, it's more of a case by case basis. You kind of, you know, if, if this as a PA, if this is not worth the battle of fighting for, then, you know, then you go, you know, then you, in some ways, you know, you will follow the changes that they recommend. But if, if you know, you know, based on your experience that, you know, it would be better for patient care then you know, sometimes you have to put your foot down, but that's not an often thing, I think, you know, but you know, there are times you may have to put your foot down and say, this is better for patient care and defend your stance. But I don't, you know, I don't, again, it's, I can't really recall the last time I've had to really butt heads with anyone. <laughs> Well, that's good. <laughs> um, another question we have is, um, at the beginning of this session, you talked about inpatient and outpatient care or outpatient work. Um, do most infectious disease uh, PAs split their time between inpatient and outpatient work? Or was this specifically what you wanted to do? Uh, yes and no. This is specifically what I wanted to do. Uh, but I, actually, a majority of my colleagues that work in ID uh, say whether that's at the VA or other hospitals, their majority of the time is inpatient and they will occasionally go outpatient. Um, so you'll find that on the spectrum. And then I have other colleagues who are completely outpatient um, doing HIV care and like sexual health and sexually transmitted infections, excuse me. And uh, they'll spend no inpatient time. So I, to answer my, personally, I wanted a little bit of both and thankfully I found that opportunity. Okay. And then another question we have is, do you think HIV patients have a good chance of living a long life? Yes. Uh, and research is showing now that patients who are diagnosed in their twenties and they're started on what's known as antiretroviral therapy or HIV specific medications, if they're diagnosed in their early 20s, they have about the lifespan, say on average, to about 71, 72 years of life from that to, you know, from 20s into their early 70s, you know, compared to, you know, the average lifespan of someone without HIV is about what, 78, 80 years old. And so, yeah, they roughly have very similar uh, lifespan based on what the new data that we're getting. And um, I mean, with my patients now, I have many that were diagnosed in the 90s, who I'm sure maybe showed up uh, to see Dr. Fowler at some point. That's probably right, Josh. They yeah. don't wear their seatbelt. Josh, I have heard in my practice that if someone has develops AIDS, uh, CD4 count under 200, that even if they reconstitute their immune system by being on antivirals and their CD4 goes back up to, you know, above 500 or six, 700, that officially they really still have AIDS because they're still somewhat subject to opportunistic infection. Do I understand that correctly or is that true? We, uh, the understanding now is that the, the 200 mark is sort of the, the, the threshold to many opportunistic infections or the 100, the CD4 or T cells being at a hundred or less than a hundred or less than 200, those we know for certain are risk factors and markers for, you know, getting opportunistic infections. Uh, someone, yeah, that maybe their immune system dropped below those numbers and gets reconstitution of immune system. 
they and they stay undetectable. I think that's the other key point as well is and carrying an undetectable viral load is actually a, a better protector of, from opportunistic infections more so than immune reconstitution in many cases, uh, especially when it comes to the pneumonia that the patient that I saw. Uh, but uh, if someone was 500s or 600s, it's almost... I wouldn't say impossible, virtually impossible to, to for someone to catch the an immune, the pneumonia that that this patient had. Uh, we wouldn't necessarily see opportunistic infections, but there are certain opportunistic cancers that can still happen because their immune system drops so low at some point. But thankfully, we don't really see any major infections happening once they've had good immune reconstitution. I hope, and I hope that kind of answers it. To, to, to follow on, yeah. what about COVID in the patient who has CD4s under 200 you know, with a clinical diagnosis of AIDS? Is COVID worse? I honestly don't know. We see a ton of COVID and we see a ton of HIV. I really haven't made the connection. Yeah, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's interesting. Majority of the patients that we see that have HIV and die from COVID, unfortunately, it's... Um, not necessarily the HIV itself. Uh, it, we have seen it fare worse in people who have AIDS, and that's mostly because they end up catching another infection on top of the COVID. So it's not necessarily the COVID. The other side of it is that, as we've seen with a lot of the other COVID patients, that they there are other risk factors, whether that's obesity or uncontrolled diabetes, uh, that has been a bigger factor than the HIV itself. Uh, but that's still an area of very active research um, that I know I'm not involved in, but I'm keeping up with and certainly very interested in seeing. Uh, but uh, we do know patients with AIDS um, definitely do not fare as well if they do get COVID. And it's mostly because they're at risk for other infections. Elena, maybe one or two more for Josh, you think? Okay. Well, I heard you say that um, a high fever and a CD4 a low CD4 T cell count uh, could be a symptom of HIV, but do you know any other symptoms uh, that could possibly lead to HIV? Yeah, well, so HIV, I, you know, I didn't touch, I won't touch too much into it as far as, or I didn't in this, uh, mm -hmm. but you can have run a mill from someone who's completely asymptomatic to someone that has COVID flu-like symptoms. So I'm sure you've seen this, Dr. Fowler, where someone went to the ER, they thought they had COVID, but it ended up being HIV. <laughs> so um, I've certainly heard that happen. Um, so yeah, that's sort of the, the, run, the gambit. You can have people who actually do have AIDS and have no symptoms whatsoever and can look completely quote unquote healthy from physical appearances. And then they'll go, you know, years without ever realizing they have HIV. And then, then they eventually decline to a point where they get an infection. Uh, so, and that sort of brings me to my major point is that, you know, wherever you all plan to work in the healthcare system, you have the opportunity to test someone for HIV and link them to an HIV care provider. Certainly, we, you know, you can play your part in helping to prevent the spread of this ongoing pandemic. Josh, as we move into your second half of your talk, I want you, I just wanted to tell you, you've been talking to 1,200 people and we've already had 63 questions polled in your first hour. You have been giving a wonderful discussion that's really, really interested all these folks who are online with us. So um, you want to take it away for your second section? Your second yes, half? thank you so much. So some teaching points. I wanted to go into a little bit more specifically about the pneumonia that this patient experienced, uh, known as pneumocystis pneumonia. You will see... Um, shorthand version abbreviations of it being PCP or PJP, and I'll explain that right now. Uh, and so it was originally thought to be caused by a protozoan, uh, but with further DNA analysis, they you know realized it was more fungal in nature. Originally, they called it, you know, it was, they attributed it to pneumocystis carinii, but then they realized this is only found in rats. And so more recently, the nomenclature or the, the, the etiology was found to be pneumocystis girovecii or hirovecii, I guess, depending on who's saying it. And to describe it further, it's a ubiquitous uh, yeast-like fungus, meaning it can be found many places. Um, it's spread via airborne route. 
So cough, sneezes, um, even ventilation. Uh, most of the times it's either a new acquisition of infection or a reactivation of a latent infection. And the big risk factors are having a CD4 or T cell that's less than 200 cells per millimeter cubed, or pretty much what we say less than a 200 count. And then having oral thrush, which I didn't mention on, but certainly that's a, a having a fungal infection um, in the back of the throat or in the mouth, it puts an increased risk. Bacterial pneumonia can also increase the risk for it. And having a high HIV viral load, um, like in his case, also attributed to his risk. And, and, and so uh, it, being in an immunocompromised state can certainly increase someone's risk for uh, having this. But the way it presented in this patient is very, I guess I'd say classic for someone who has uncontrolled HIV, has AIDS because of weakened immune system. His presentation is very classic for this fungal pneumonia. And that's what it looks like under gram staining. So a uh, clinical presentation, it's classically what we call a dyspnea on exertion. So shortness of breath with, with movement and uh, in clinic or in many settings, if we suspect someone has this, uh, our poor man's test, as we call it, is an ambulatory O2 saturation. So we'll actually do this in clinic where we'll put a pulse ox on someone's finger and then we'll actually just walk with them around the clinic. And if their O2 is declining, a lot of times that can help support you know, our, our suspicion of this diagnosis. Certainly it's not all relying on the O2 sat, but certainly it helps support uh, the clinical picture. You can have a non-productive or a productive cough. In the case of a productive cough, like with the patient in the hospital, ideally we would have wanted to get a sputum sample, but couldn't. And it's usually more of a, a subacute onset, as we say, three to six weeks. He came in after about a month of having these symptoms in the hospital. And so that sort of fits in that, what we'd call subacute. So it wasn't like he woke up one morning and, and he felt like a train hit him, as some patients will describe, or it's not something like, maybe COPD or something that can go on for months and months, certainly wasn't up to a chronic nature, but it can feel seem chronic in the sense that it's been going on for longer than a month, but classically we call it more subacute. Uh, and then fever and sweats. Again, they, this is not a like a checklist that they have to have all these things, but certainly these can help support a diagnosis uh, or support the history of the picture of someone that has um, this pneumonia. And then chest discomfort, of course. Um, that could be from the coughing. It could be from the, the pulmonary infection. Um, and then, so how do we diagnose it? We can get blood and serum sampling. And for a callback to um, organic chemistry, um, we need a fungitel test. We'll look at what's known as the beta D glucan levels. Um, if they're greater than 500, uh, we'll look at lactate dehydrogenase if they're greater than 500. And um, I didn't include it with the patient that I presented, but these were vastly elevated and helped support our diagnosis of his pneumocystis pneumonia. And by vastly, I think his fungitel was about 600 and the lactase was also about just over 500. Sorry, lactate dehydrogenase. Uh, sputum culture would be ideal. Actually, if you can get a, a good and, and usually expirated or induced sputum uh, may actually be the best sputum to get. And then we'll actually do like a direct probe of that sputum in the lab. Well, I won't do it, but we'll order it. And then our lab techs who are able to get that and then look for specific antigens to or of the pneumocystis. Uh, or pneumocystis gerovicii species. Uh, it's very sensitive test. And then sputum culture, and that's a picture of a sputum culture, not necessarily PJP sputum culture, but uh, what a sputum culture may look like, plated. And certainly hypoxemia um, will help to diagnose this as well too. And then um, if you're not able to get good sputum culturing, a bronchoscopy, so having a pulmonologist do direct visualization uh, in addition to collecting a sample um, during a wash or bronco alveolar lavage, BAL for short, we can actually do that um, 
the direct probe on that sampling to determine if what is causing the symptoms is uh, PJP. And so um, we will use most of these modalities that we can. Certainly if someone's in the hospital, we can get those blood and serum samplings. If we can get the sputum culture, we can do it. If we're not able to, then we would resort to bronchoscopy. And again, it's a collection of the, the history that we get from the patient in addition to these lab values, in addition to you know sputum culturings. But to call back to the patient, we actually weren't able to get a bronchoscopy or a, a good sputum culture from this patient. We A lot of it was from that imaging that we got. Um, or not, sorry, not from the imaging, but the story, the imaging, the other lab values we were able to get, like the, the blood and serum values to help support this diagnosis. And then given his improvement with the appropriate antibiotics that helped direct us towards the etiology or the causing agent. Um, the sort of gold standard for diagnosing this is a CT scan of the chest. A chest X-ray is good and it may help show some stuff. You may actually see the interstitial You'll hear our bilateral reticulonodular butterfly pattern infiltrates. These are sort of like key phrases you'll hear in them. The picture here is those of a CT scan. Um, another classic thing that I didn't mention is that if a young patient that maybe has no other risk factor shows up with a pneumothorax and no other medical history, PJP can result or pneumocystis pneumonia can result in causing a pneumothorax. Uh, the other sort of pathognomonic or as we'd say like a key thing that shows up is ground glass opacities. Uh, but there are other things that can show this. So, uh, you know, it's not like ground glass opacities means automatically, you know, PJP in someone like this patient, but certainly helps support the diagnoses. Or in like his case, there was a normal chest X-ray. And so, you know, couldn't totally rule it out and say that there was no lung infection based solely on one imaging modality. Uh, so a little further on treating this, uh, the total duration is 21 days. So back to our patient, he had about 14 days in the hospital and he finished that last week or last seven days outpatient on his own before coming to see me. Usually is about five milligrams per kilogram IV in the moderate to severe cases. Certainly he was intubated, so we consider that very severe. Uh, and uh, usually about every six, eight hours. And then when they're able to tolerate it, you'd switch to, you know, by mouth or PO formulation. And then you would add on corticosteroid taper. He had dexamethasone in his case. In a more mild to moderate case, we can actually treat a lot of this on the outpatient setting. Uh, where they don't even need to get admitted for IV antibiotics, and we'll, we will treat them with high dose Bactrim or trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole every eight hour basis. So it's very, it's a high amount, and we do follow closely because these can be very um, marrow suppressive or bone marrow suppressive, uh, in addition to being very nephrotoxic if we don't manage it. And that that's also another side that we, you know, when we're inpatient, we monitor labs in addition to the antibiotics, but, and the same thing on the outpatient side as well, too. You know, certainly these high dose antibiotics are not safe. <laughs> uh, keep that in mind. They're certainly toxic at, at varying levels, and it's our duty to make sure we monitor um, those things, whether that's kidney function, liver function, uh, or complete blood count and monitoring white blood cells and so on and so forth. And that's something that you learn as you go through your training to monitor. The other thing, I like to throw a tovacone in there because certainly that, that has made the news occasionally um, <laughs> um, in the past few months. But we also use this, uh, and it's usually a yellow syrup, and uh, it's kind of gross tasting. And so patients will mix it with water, dilute it, and can drink that <laughs> and um, for mild to moderate outpatient cases. Again, it's usually for someone who's not admitted. And so his immune system was very weak on our patient and we can actually prevent this thanks to antibiotics. Say someone who has a CD4 that's less than 200 or a weakened immune system, whether that is due to HIV or that's due to maybe being on steroids for an immunocompromising, maybe they're about to get a transplant and so they're on corticosteroids or maybe someone, you know, is as a cancer patient undergoing chemotherapy and having to, you know, again, take certain treatments and their immune system's very weak. 
uh, you could still recommend, um, you know, prophylaxis for this. Um, and it actually is Bactrim as well, and but it's more of a lower dose. It is a double strength, but again, a once daily tablet, um, but not as toxic, but certainly continue to monitor. Other things that can be given as well is also Bactrim in a three times weekly dosing, and then Dapsone is another thing that can be given as well as Tovacone. So this is just to show we have a variety of options to prevent this infection, and it's proven very much effective in preventing this infection as people, you know, as their immune system say recovers uh, in our patient's case or someone you want to prevent them from having this infection. Um, let me see. And, you know, you want to, you know, yeah, prevent them from having this infection and give them the best outcomes. Oh, uh, let's see. Someone had raised their hand. I don't know if I need to address that. It like popped up on my screen. Um, Will, I'll take the question for you and uh, we'll, we'll present it. A oh, bit okay. I wasn't sure. Um, so sort of the last little bits here, why should you care? Um, the global impact of HIV AIDS, there are currently about 38 million people who are affected worldwide, currently living with HIV and or AIDS. Um, testing about 81% of people with HIV worldwide have been tested and know their status, but then that also means there's 90% of people who don't know their status and they're out there spreading this virus or they're getting sicker without realizing it and potentially can get an infection. And, and so I, I bring this up because um, you know testing is the essential first step and I'm very grateful to our ER, ER colleagues, our emergency medicine colleagues who test frequently and uh, the hospital I'm at, at, at over at Parkland, um, they, I think on average, I mean, we test about 50,000 patients for HIV, I want to say a year, it might be more. Uh, our testing is very robust and very, I guess, very rapid and that will get people linked to care if they have HIV. And so, you know, like I said, a lot of people can be asymptomatic and spread it and not realize it. And so, you know, um, testing really is the first step to, you know, helping to stop the spread of this virus. Um, AIDS related deaths have though been reduced thanks to medications like the patient that I have or the many patients I have. Uh, we've seen a reduction in deaths by 60% uh, with about 690,000 people worldwide dying from AIDS related illnesses, which is compared to maybe about 10 years in 2010 prior rose about 1.1 million people. So, we, we live in a very fortunate age of very safe, I wouldn't say completely safe, but certainly very tolerable medications, um, a way a lot better than the, the AZTs or the Zdovidines or the protease inhibitors of the 90s or the experimental drugs from the 90s and the early 2000s. We, we have great treatment options right now and people are living healthier, longer lives. And we're like in my clinic, we're more so worried about people you know, dying from heart attacks or high cholesterol, diabetes, diabetic foot wounds, um, you know, dying from normal things or, or the common things I should say that people with or without HIV may experience. And, and I also bring this up because you, no matter where you go in the healthcare system, whether you decide to work in medicine or not, or maybe you want to, you know, your path finds you working as a social worker or caseworker or your path is in mental health, you're going to encounter people living with HIV. Uh, you know, again, that number does continue to grow. And as people are living longer with HIV, they're, you're going to see they're becoming part of our aging, our geriatric population. And so no matter where you're going to go in the healthcare system, you will encounter patients living with HIV. If you work in a primary care setting, or maybe you work in a hospital setting, you will diagnose someone with HIV. And if you're a PA, an MD, an NP, a DO, you're a healthcare provider, you may have to deliver that news to a patient. And certainly as you go through training, that's something you're equipped with doing, but that's to say it never gets easier, but it's something that you, you know, will have to do at some point in your career. So how do you tell them? I mean, you might, we've, we've had several questions on that. So hmm. since you brought it up, can you tell us? Well, uh, you, you have to lay the facts out, certainly showing the test and lay the facts out. But 
it, there is an art and you find your way of doing it uh, in the clinic setting. It's certainly allowing time for this person to process that information. Um, it's not about bombarding them with, oh, you can take this med, this and this and this med and, or not, sorry, <laughs> you can take this med and take care of it or this and that. It, it is presenting them the, the high yield points of, we can, you know, there is this movement that's been going on for the past five to 10 years known as rapid start. And so patients that do get diagnosed in the ER, they'll get connected to an HIV provider almost the same day or within a week. And so, uh, you know, you want to allow them time to process, but you also want to be able to equip them with the tools. And so, um, to, you know, to, to deliver this news to someone, it is a delicate process and, but you just have to be clear and direct. Uh, I think that, that goes with also having to give, you know, a cancer diagnosis as well to you, you, you know, we have to, you know, respect the space and allow patient time to, you know, comprehend and, and, um, digest the information they got. So it's best not to bombard them with the, the details, but it is best to give them the clear, the facts that are necessary to say, take the next step, say like, yes, you have this disease, but yes, we can do something about it. Yeah. You know, Josh, I've seen over the years that kind of in a way there are patients sometime you have to give, give them some extraordinarily bad news. And Personally, what I and professionally, what I found, I kind of give it to them in doses a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like, start with, I come in and sit down. I said, I need to talk to you about something. You know that chest X-ray that we ran a while ago? Well, yes, doctor. What about it? Well, the chest X-ray wasn't actually normal. You know, and give it to them in doses yeah. as you go forward. Josh, a question popped up while you were talking just then about this. HIV is a reportable disease. Do you have an obligation from the standpoint of when you have a patient who's HIV positive, aside from reporting it to the health department, I, which I guess y'all do, um, do you take the reporting any further? I mean, to the patient's partner or anything like that? So the laws actually are variable depending on the state that you live in. And thankfully, there our health department here in Dallas um, does a lot of the follow-up um, and anonymous partner contacting. We encourage it in our patients who are newly diagnosed to reach out to their partners if they can. But if maybe, you know, out of, you know, not uncomfortable, to, you know, being uncomfortable, or maybe it was a, a one time or a former partner, there is anonymous notification systems that are electronic that do text messaging. Uh, and there, again, the health department, you know, um, will have representatives go out and reach out to these, uh, to do, you know, to get other people to get tested, say the partners or former partners of this person who ha has a new HIV diagnosis. So, um, um, but I personally don't contact the partners <laughs> to answer that question. Let's see now, Medicare and Medicaid cover these medications, Josh, is that true? Yeah, that is true. Um, there is a lot of copay assistance, and I didn't touch upon this, but uh, since 1994, we've had the Ryan White Act, which is under HRSA, and um, it is a federal program that funds a lot of the HIV care and medications um, for as a sort of payer of last resort. So people who do not have any insurance um, or do not meet a certain income level and may be undocumented as well, too. Uh, they fit under that umbrella and can get medications covered. They're very expensive, and thankfully, m pretty much every major insurance company or um, you know pr federal and state government program provides some funding assistance. Uh, a while ago, you mentioned HIV one and HIV two, and you said mm -hmm. HIV HIV two seemed to be predominantly uh, in Africa. Did you say um, yes? Did I understand that correctly? And, and is the treatment different? So they're actually, actually, yes, treatment is different. And there honestly isn't truly a specific HIV-2 treatment. There are some cocktails or formulations that are done that are used for HIV-1. And we may take a two or three different classes of HIV meds. So there's not a single tablet for patients who have HIV-2. The other aside from HIV-2 as well that we see a lot and we're still <laughs> surprisingly still learning about is that it is very much slower progressive disease 
compared to HIV-1 in the sense that sometimes people are able, their immune systems are, quote, robust enough to keep it under control um, and not cause any major illness as they get older. And they may not actually need uh, medications. And we kind of sometimes loop them into what we call like long-term non-progressors or elite controllers. Those are sort of the the lingo we like to use for some of those patients. But I, I honestly have only encountered one HIV, patient with HIV-2 and they were not on medications. So um, yeah, again, it, you know, it's, it's much slower and we don't have specific medications for it, just possible options that aren't studied too well. Uh, please continue, Josh. I'm sorry yeah. I interrupted. Oh, no. I, I like to answer questions. And then sort of the, uh, to add on that, um, you know, you as a future healthcare provider have a chance to end the stigma and help these patients control the virus. Again, it's becoming a chronic disease for many of these patients. And again, worried, I'm more worried about them, you know, having, you know, cervical cancer or breast cancer or, you know, um, colon cancer, or I'm worried about their diabetes. I'm worried about their blood pressure. And then having a heart attack or having a stroke. Uh, I mean, these are common things that all of us have to worry about as we get older. And certainly, you know, again, you know, you will encounter them as you move through your healthcare careers. And then you can stop the spread of HIV. I, I think, um, you know, that's an important empowering point for future healthcare providers to realize. And so how do we stop the spread? Well, uh, this information came out from about, I want to say 2016, 2017, and the CDC endorsed this too, known as the U equals U campaign, which stands for undetectable equals untransmissible, or also known as treatment as prevention. And so what that refers to is taking treatment every day. So someone that has HIV is taking their medication every day, and they maintain an undetectable viral load. Again, we can't cure HIV, but we can control it. We can keep it suppressed to the point where the labs, the machines can't pick up the copies of the virus in the serum or in the blood. And then by maintaining this, they can effectively prevent transmission via sex with their partners. Uh, and this comes from the partner study, uh, which they documented about 77,000 condomless sex acts um, of heterosexual or and, um, and men who have sex with men or or transgender women who have both or who have also sex with men. And they saw that there was 0% chance of, or there was actually zero cases of transmission in those who had an undetectable viral load. So this was very big news that came out and supports a lot of our patients now. So yeah, the, by having people on treatment, you're preventing them from spreading the virus to other partners that they may have, um, in the future. The other thing of that you can do to help stop the spread of HIV is to start a patient on pre-exposure prophylaxis. I touched upon this earlier. Uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis is a pill. It is an HIV pill, but it's not the full on, it's only one class. It's not a full on cocktail of medications, uh, but it is only one pill once a day. And so if someone who doesn't have HIV, they can take this to prevent them from contracting the virus. Say they have a partner with HIV or they have multiple sex partners, or they just have, you know, you know, maybe they have occasional casual sex or what have you, and they're, they want to protect themselves. This is something that many of you who will go into healthcare, whether you become primary care providers yourself, not even in the HIV setting, but say, you're going to have a patient in front of you who's like, Hey, um, I'm interested in prep. You know, this is, or maybe they're saying, I want a way of protect myself from HIV. They won't have HIV, but they will ask you. And this is an option that has been effective proven to protect them as they live their life. So, uh, yeah, again, these are yeah, touch points that you will be able to, um, you know, have, have a, you know, a duty or responsibility and you can actually do something about, um, and you don't have to be in HIV care to necessarily be involved with stopping the spread. Uh, like I said, if you work in any primary care setting, you have the opportunity to, you know, maybe continue someone on their medications or start them on something until they see a specialist for the, their treatment. Josh, mm -hmm. can a pregnant mama take um, a pill? and keep from transmitting the kid, the 
virus to the to the uh, fetus? Yes, that is a great question, and the short answer is yes. Uh, and it, uh, there is not a single tablet to prevent, but that's there is a proven effectiveness in as a woman. Uh, who has an undetectable viral load will also effectively prevent transmission to their future offspring. And the same thing goes for, say, uh, a man who, you know, has, you know, a, you know, to the, can't pass it on to the pregnant mother if that man has an undetectable viral load. And so, because sometimes our, our, you know, male patients are concerned, oh, well, well, my, you know, because certainly we've HIV can be carried with sperm. And so they're worried, oh, is that, is my future, you know, offspring going to get it as well? Well, if he has an undetectable viral load, then he, the both parents say, you know, they can prevent that future offspring from getting HIV. So yeah, great question. And, and we see a lot of, you know, babies that are delivered um, to mothers with HIV or fathers with HIV, and they're completely healthy. Or they they have you know negative um, HIV tests, and and so again an attribute to medicine uh, and how far it's come and you know these patients are living longer and if they're diagnosed in their twenties a lot of them yeah they want to have families and want to have kids and that is the other awesome thing that I'm able to see is they're able to do these things safely and protect their their future offspring. One question came up. <clears throat> excuse me. Sorry about. Uh, treating HIV in pediatric patients and kids, um, are, the, are the medicines the same or is there something different about being younger? Yes, uh, if we're talking about infants, and now I'll, I'll I guess with a, uh, and let everyone know, I mostly only treat 17 year olds and older who have HIV, but I have you know come into contact with say the mothers or the parents of, of potentially uh, offspring with HIV and, or maybe patients that were born with HIV and the, the treatment is variable from infants. It's usually like, you know, an oral syrup formulation or solution, oral solution formulation of some of these HIV medications. It's usually multiple or might be a, like a, a crushed pill or, a, you know, a pill cut in half. And then, and that, you know, will become more like you know, a couple different pills as they get older, but then once they sort of reach, I want to say 13, 14 years old, the medication is pretty much the same as what we would give to the adults. It just might be a lower dosing um, or might be a slightly different formulation. And it might not be one pill, it might be two pills. So again, again, it's, it's variable, but we, you know, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Um, I think, um, Elena, if I haven't put you totally to sleep, I think there are three or four more questions for Josh. Uh, yeah, so we do have a couple more questions. Um, one is, uh, was there a defining moment when you decided uh, to no longer pursue your PhD and instead pursue your career as a PA? Yeah, I, I th it was the... Because I, I worked under um, other postdocs or other Prince PIs that were working in a research, and I I didn't I guess I didn't see myself I don't say a specific moment, but I just didn't see myself really like spending much time in the lab or uh, you know wanting to work on manuscripts and do you know internal review board stuff and other grants and things like that. Um, I didn't see myself getting involved in all that. And I saw myself wanting to be at the bedside or be at the patient side and, uh, you know, watching, you know, patients get better. That was something that, that I was like, oh, this is what I want to do instead. And so sort of switch gears that way. Um, another question we have is, uh, well, if you could speak about your work-life balance as a mm -hmm. PA. Yeah. So like I said, my, when I'm inpatient, it's usually like eight hour shifts. When I'm outpatient, it's 10 hour shifts. Uh, and it's usually Monday through Friday. So I mostly have my weekends. And so, yeah, work life balance that way. <laughs> have, well, you know, I had my weekends to travel or, you know, I, I certainly do have some holidays off throughout the year. So, you know, I am able to see family and friends. Uh, again, I'm referring to um, BCE or before COVID era, but, you know, we'll see how things go. All right. And a very popular question we have is, um, so someone just got their Pfizer vaccine 
And on the questionnaire, there was an option to check off yes or no if you have HIV or AIDS. Mm -hmm. um, what, uh, what would happen if someone who did not know they had HIV and got a Pfizer vaccine? So this is a question that's also great. We get this a lot from our patients who are very weary of getting the COVID vaccines or they really want it and they want to ask what will happen. I can't speak specific to Pfizer, but I know that from the patient populations that they study, there was probably only about somewhere between 150 to 200 out of the Pfizer and the Moderna studies looking at HIV patients. I mean, they all had CD4s that were not considered AIDS. So they didn't really study AIDS specific patients. And so um, to, the reason they probably asked that on the survey is because we don't have all the answers and data from our HIV specific patients or patients who also have AIDS. Uh, we certainly can extrapolate from or infer from previous vaccines, say like the hepatitis B vaccine. If someone has a CD4 or, or has AIDS, they will not effectively amount, amount of, of an immune response to um, the hepatitis B vaccine. And so I think that's part of the concern too that we're having now is if someone has AIDS, maybe they might not necessarily mount an appropriate immune response or create antibodies in response to uh, exposure to these you know, uh, vaccines. But uh, as far as having side effects to it, certainly what we've seen in our patients so far, it's pretty much the same if, you know, side effects that everyone else has been experiencing. And that's sort of what the studies were showing too. Nothing as far as super major events um, relative. I mean, it's, it's comparable to the general population. So I think they mostly probably asked that at because just because we don't have the full, you know, the story yet. Okay, well, that's good to know. Yeah. Um, I'll do one more question unless Dr. Fowler has one. Um, but this question is, is what is the most urgent unmet need in HIV medicine and research? Oh, in research. Yes. Uh, and I am actually involved in research in some regard. I didn't mention this because it's also not really a majority of my time. Uh, I have patients who are enrolled in studies that are actually run through UT Southwestern. And so our, our, some of our ID faculty take our, you know, in our principal investigators on certain studies. And so the gr growing areas of research in HIV, one, it's as our patients are getting older, they're, you know, again, like I said, experiencing, you know, diabetes, cancers, heart attacks, strokes, sort of the, you know, same cardio, or they're having cardiovascular events, um, just like patients without HIV. And so that is an, an area that we have patients enrolled in, in trying to see, you know, what is their effective risk as they get older compared to patients who don't have HIV, or what interventions can we do early on? Certainly HIV is considered an inflammatory process as a whole. And so we have a lower threshold to say, start someone on cholesterol medication or to get better control of their A1C or their diabetes. Uh, but again, active research in that regard. And then uh, there is active research as far as medications go. I didn't mention this, but I mean, the standard of care is, is um, oral therapy, oral medications for HIV, but we are now moving into a realm that unfortunately was halted by the pandemic, but we're moving towards a realm of, of treatment that will involve injection therapy possibly, um, or patches or implantables, kind of like an explanon for pregnancy. Uh, we're seeing that this is sort of, we're moving into a paradigm shift of treatment. I mean, it's not going to be this year, maybe early remnants or early startings of it, but there were the seeds of it, but we're moving into a paradigm shift of, you know, there's not a one size fit all treatment. You know, we, we can, there's new treatment that will be able to fit certain people's lifestyles. And that's an exciting growing field. Josh, what a wonderful talk. Geez, that, <laughs> uh, Josh, you had 1,226 people just sitting on the edge of their chairs tonight, listening to your every word. And I just, this was terrific. Thank you so much. I learned myself so much tonight and I, it gives me at least a dozen things that I've got, I've got to go read about. Thank you very much. So thank Josh, you we, all uh, so much. Wow. Um, I, I want you to look at chat now and uh, everybody put thank you, Josh, in chat. <clears throat> and I want you to watch 
about 800 people. Uh, Papa, big thank you for that. And then what did, what did you put here? The mark of a good ID? What? Oh, yeah. So I wanted to sort of, before I go to, I guess, the survey slide, I know I have to do that. This is actually from one of uh, uh, my mentors or one of my uh, you know faculty colleagues at UT Southwestern, Dr. Brad Cutrell. Um, he, I took this from one of his presentations, but a mark of a good ID clinician is not how many antibiotics he or she starts, but how many he or she stops. And so, you know, as you all move into your healthcare careers, wherever that may be, you are going to have to prescribe antibiotics or be involved in antibiotic management. It's not all on ID. A lot of it is in primary care and the field you work in. And so, you know, being specific and being good stewards of antibiotics is something that I, I hope you all can be as you move forward. Well, Josh, you know, the, um, another article appeared this week about the risk with the fluoroquinolone antibiotics like Cipro being associated with aortic aneurysms, but, you know, because it does tissue damage. So, yes. Uh, yes, such very, very important things is that, you know, the number of resistant organisms that we have now that we're not here at all, you know, 40 and 50 years ago and such very important things to think about. Well, Josh, thank you. Thank you so much. This, what a terrific talk. I, Josh, probably... 5,000 of our pre-med providers will take the exam that we're going to be, and we'll also view your talk because uh, we post it on YouTube. Uh -huh. Each one of those 5,000 in a medical career will see about 100,000 uh, patients in a career. 5,000 times 100,000 is a half a billion. So tonight, Josh, you've touched a half a billion lives. So thank you so much wow. <laughs> for your grace and your kindness. We just, we're deeply appreciated. Oh, thank um, you for, Elena, you want to explain this quest, quest based thing to us? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. So here's the assessment. Uh, you just have to go to quest base. Uh, you do not need an account. Um, you can see at the bottom, there's the pin and the password. Um, this, if you guys don't get it now either, it will be posted on Instagram and the virtual shadowing website. I'm also putting it in chat. Okay, uh, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for the 1200 of you that showed up. Josh, thank you so much for your kindness. I look forward to seeing you around the ER uh, yeah. at Parkland sometime soon. Yeah, I mean, I'll be uh, on service tomorrow, so <laughs> <laughs> I, might, well, I might stop by. <laughs> and if, okay, we'll look for you. I'll buy you a cup of coffee. Mm. Um, so everybody, thank you for coming. This What a terrific session. Uh, we're going to keep being here as long as you keep coming back. So on behalf of the virtual shadowing team and Josh and all the members and Dr. Salazar's virtual clinical observation program, um, which we look forward to getting it underway very, very soon now. Uh, we wanna thank you for coming. And uh, on behalf of everybody, we wish you all a great evening. Thank you for coming.